Hello, Tony Laird here, and welcome to part two of lecture 11 of ENGR 231 Engineering Statics. In this part of the lecture, I'd like to discuss the various types of joints found in frames and simple machines. So types of joints. And these are going to be fairly uh, similar to a lot of things we've seen before, uh, especially in trusses, pins, rollers, etc. Uh, types of joints. Type of types of joints, and we have a few that I want to talk about. And uh, the major ones that, I, that I'm going to refer to are the uh, fixed, the pin, and the uh, roller. And how these work in the context of uh, joints. So we've seen how the, each of these work when they are uh, supports, but they have similar analogs when we're looking at internal joints rather than just external reactions. So let us look at each of these. A fixed uh, joint. So let's maybe look at each of these on its own little slide. Or maybe I just all of them here. Let's just we'll see where we can fit. So a fixed joint is capable of transmitting uh, two directions of translation and one direction of rotation. And of course, I'm doing this for the 2D case. If it's a 3D uh, system, then obviously it's quite a bit more complex. But all the frame analysis we're going to do in this course is going to be uh, two-dimensional, plain frame, basically uh, planar frames. So a fixed joint is one uh, capable of transmitting uh, two directions of force and a single direction of moment, or just and moment, if we're talking about uh, planar frames. And maybe just to be up, uh, very clear, one direction of moment. So, if you see just one member coming into another with no kind of other indication of what that is, um, then that means you have a fixed joint here. So. Uh, sometimes you'll see like a circle indicating there's a pin. Sometimes you'll see something that will indicate a roller. Uh, sometimes you'll see, uh, you know, springs and ropes and things like that. But uh, if there is nothing else there, then that means you have, if you just have one member just connecting directly into another, that is a sign that you have a fixed joint. So let's think about this. Let's say you have a, um, let us isolate this joint. Let's say this is joint A. Uh, well, this is what it looks like. Well, let, let's look at something a little bit more. Oh, let's say I had this member here, and let's say this was A, B, and C, and each member was, sub uh, was uh, subject to some arbitrary loading. So then the, let's blow this up and look at what kind of forces would be transmitted through this joint. So let's imagine cutting this kind of like this and like this, and what kind of forces are transmitted through this? So how would I analyze this? How would I break this into pieces? And this is getting a bit ahead of ourselves. We'll see, how, I'll, I'll discuss more later on in later portions of this lecture how to uh, analyze these in a bit more rigorous way. But imagine that I could break this into pieces and see what kind of forces are gonna be transmitted through these joints. Well, let's say this is joint B, of course. So I might say there is a, maybe this joint would be capable of transmitting both a BX if my thing can keep jumping, uh, maybe a BY, and some sort of MB, like this. A BX, a BY, and some sort of MB. And where would these forces appear on these members? Well, how do you know which direction they're going to apply to, to the members? Well, it's just, uh, we can assume whatever directions we want, but we simply have to be consistent with uh, Newton's third law, equal and opposite. So, BY, would be applied downward like this, BX would be applied like this, and MB like so. MB like so. Again, equal and opposite. And then somewhere here, we would have a uh, something like this, uh, a BX.
Wait, my, sorry, my pen is giving me some trouble here. A BX, a downward BY, and uh, some sort of uh, then an MB. In this case, it would be clockwise. Now, you would set it up this way if you were actually modeling the joint as its own discrete thing. Often I don't do that, especially for simpler frames. I'll just actually uh, not draw out the entire, I'll just not draw out the entire um, um, joint there, and I'll just show one member directly connecting to another. And that's fine. In that case, and this is going to be particularly important, particularly important if you are going to be uh, modeling a forces applied to the joints themselves as discrete objects. But, and this is more common for higher level structural analysis, we're going to tend to use more in, um, in statics is something like this, where you just draw each member coming into the joint and then showing uh, forces being transmitted through that. So you might have a um, something like this, a by, and then a downward by here, a downward by there, then maybe a bx to the left, and then this would have, or to the right, and then this bx would go to the left, and then maybe some sort of mb here, and then some sort of mb here. Uh, something like that. Okay, again, that is what a fixed joint is going to do. It's going to transmit force in both the x direction, the y direction, and also some sort of moment. And that one's fairly straightforward. And so then the pin joint, very similar to pin reactions or pin supports, is going to transmit a force in two directions, but no moment. Uh, but no moment. So if you have a member, and this is very similar to what we've seen previously, and there's really only one good way to analyze these. Let's say you have a pin here and another member coming in here like this. This is a pin joint. Although, uh, interestingly enough, um, one of the common distinctions between trusses and frames is that a truss uh, all of the members will actually end at the pins. Uh, with frames, the members can are perfectly capable of continuing through the pins. So in a truss, we saw that no member actually continued all the way beyond a joint. But here, I can for, but for frames, I can just have a pin right in the middle of this longer member and just have another member connected to it right in the middle, like an old erector set or something like that. So if I were to separate this one out, for example, I would have... If I were to separate this out, for example, and draw this out a little separated, let's say this was joint A. What I would draw is I'd probably draw the pin here and the pin here. Oh, uh, let's see. I would have an AX, an AY, and then in the opposite direction, an AX and a downward AY. Often the direction we assume for these things is purely arbitrary, as we will discuss later on. The direction we assume is usually purely arbitrary, but what does matter is it doesn't usually matter whether you assume AY on this, uh, for the top member is up or down. But what does matter is if this one is upward, this one needs to be downward because of Newton's third law. Then uh, for a uh, roller joint, or sometimes called a slotted pin or something like that. There are many different ways of describing these. Roller joint or a slotted pin. Uh, this will transmit only one direction of translational force. or one direction of force. And you'll be able to know that direction just by looking at it. So for example, this is less common. This would be like a direct application of, um, you don't really see this that often, uh, this that often in diagrams, but this would be almost like directly like what you see uh, for roller supports drawn. 
In this type of thing, it would only be capable of transmitting force in one direction. Well, it would only be capable of transmitting force in this direction. So if we separate this out, if we were to go and separate this out, well, what do we see? I have a, I would have two members. Let me draw this actually below here. Oh, like this. If this was joint A, if this was joint A, I would have maybe an AY here and an AY here. Again, equal and opposite. And that's just like a literal pin just sort of resting on two members. But that's not usually what you see in this type of frame uh, system. What you tend to see more often is something like this. Like imagine you have uh, a longer member and built into it is a slot um, that you then put a roller inside. So if you have a long uh, longitudinal slot, uh, something like this, And then inside this, so basically you have a member, but there's a hollow slot in the middle. Then in the middle, you have a pin, and then attached to that pin is another member. Again, attached to that pin is another member. And I just have another member coming down like this. So what happens with this is that it can transmit force up or down, but if it tries to transmit force left or right, then you're going to have a problem. And the problem with that is that it's just going to slide. It's not going to be able to move. So in turn, this ends up producing the same exact kind of system as we saw earlier uh, over here. So we would have basically our one member and then the slotted member like this with its uh, hollow slot here. And this does not have to be horizontal. You can orient these at any direction or in any direction. And this would be transmitting a single force perpendicular to the slot. So you'd have uh, maybe some sort of AY like this and AY like this, if that's called joint A, for example. And that's the basic idea between, uh, basic difference between uh, rollers, joints, and pins. Also, this uh, was bothering me a bit, and the reason for it was that, uh, I'm th I mean, this has been bugging the back of my mind, and I finally figured out what the problem was. Uh, in this case, if I were draw, to draw it as like three different things, I would basically need a, let me show you how, if you wanted to actually use this base, this approach, you can't, if you want to actually separate out the, the joint uh, in the fixed joints for their own uh, method, for their own discrete objects, say you had like a downward force applied to it and you wanted to, to only the joint and you wanted to model that, how you actually have to do that according to structural theory. And so this is, what was bothering me is that things weren't in the, uh, the force on this one wasn't the opposite of this one. So. You would almost need like a, um, maybe like some sort of like, uh, if this was joint B, like a BY1 and a BX1, like this. And then an M, a B, an MB1, like that. And then maybe you would have a, something like this, actually the opposite direction. The MB1 and then a BY1 here a by1 and then a bx1 on this side and then a uh for this member maybe you'd have a if this was member one and this was member two you'd have something like a bx2 and a matching bx2 on this one and then a matching uh then a by1 a B Y one and a matching B Y one and then some sort of uh, not the same I don't want to connect that directly some sort of M B two the second moment uh, M B two here and then a corresponding M B two so this stuff gets very complicated and it's actually difficult to draw on uh, such a small screen. I probably should have blown this up a bit more. But the point being, the only time you usually tend to actually uh, draw out those separate, uh, uh, draw out the joint as a discrete object like this in these free body diagrams is if I'm applying forces. Like if I showed there was a couple applied directly to joint B, 
then it might be beneficial to do that or it might just be beneficial to treat the joint as an extension of one of the members or something like that. This is more important in higher level structural analysis. We're not going to worry about this too much. Uh, the fixed joints that we deal with in statics class are going to be relatively simple like this. What was bothering me was that this moment wasn't going wasn't going equal and opposite to that, and so that's what was bothering me. And I recall now that if you wanted to do this properly, you need to break it up into two different moments because uh, you need to label them differently because you could have couples and forces apply to that joint. But that's a bit of an aside. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't misleading anyone and was consistent with higher level structural theory. Okay, so I think that'll do it for this portion of the lecture. I just wanted to introduce the main three types of joints that you will see. Oh, also, one other final follow-up thought. <laughs> not done yet. Uh, one final thing you sometimes do see are ropes. Ropes, cords, etc. One final type of, these aren't really joints, but they're almost modeled as their own objects. Uh, they will simply transmit a single force along their axis. A tensile force. along the axis of the rope. Relatively simple. So if you have a, oh, something like this, if there is a, maybe a frame like this, Let's say I have a rope here, and I've applied tension to that rope via some winching mechanism, some sort of pulling mechanism. Well, I could then just model that as a, if I was not breaking the, the whole thing up yet, I could just model that as uh, a tension force here and a tension force here. But that's not really a type of joint, but I, I, I did want to include that in this discussion. The main things you, uh, but just as a slight aside, the main things you need to be concerned with are fixed joints, pin joints and roller or slotted joints, and as long as you're aware of those, uh, we'll be able to move forward uh, in analyzing uh, simple fra frames and simple machines. All right, that'll do for this portion of the lecture. In part three, we're going to look at what I refer to as the difference between global analysis and local analysis, or uh, maybe treat, or really treating the entire frame as a single rigid body versus breaking it up into pieces for the uh, via the exploded view. All right, that'll do it for now. I'll see you all soon for part three, and as always, Thank you.